having pointed out those classical features, let me show you the quantum mechanical solutions. Um, solutions for this differential equation. Um, once again, we are not going to do anything to actually get these solutions. Uh, get the solutions, you, I, it, that's in your book. But um, you should know at least what they look like. So they look like this. Um, they involve something called Hermite polynomial and some, I don't know. I, I think a lowest energy state looks like a Gaussian, but I think there's some sinusoidal thing in there. So quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, so potential, write it in this form. All right, so this is the uh, Schrodinger equation. And oh, um, so we will talk about this. So these are, when you go through all the solution, upper division stuff, this is what you find are the allowed energies for your oscillator. And n can take values starting from zero. So your minimum possible energy is, minimum is h bar omega over two. So that's the minimum possible energy for this quantum mechanical oscillator. Uh, sometimes that's called the zero point energy. And like when science fiction talks about zero point energy, uh, well, that's what they are referring to, or uh, that's what their technical advisors are referring to <laughs> on those TV shows <laughs> or movies. <laughs> um, um, now, so this uh, energy, these energies, so you can plug this back into here, and we'll actually do that shortly, and then uh, find what functions satisfy the resulting differential equation. And uh, you find that for different values of n here, you get different forms of solution that looks like this. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, Gaussian thing. This is the Hermite polynomial. I thought there was also a sinusoidal thing here somewhere. I don't know. Um, all right, so <laughs> not important. You will never have to memorize this, but you should have a sense of what they look like. So this is the lowest energy state, n equals zero. This is the next high energy state, n equals one. This is the next high energy state, n equals two. And these are actually drawn to scale. This is one half, one whole unit of h bar omega, next to whole unit of h bar omega. It's following those energy levels that were given up here. Starting with a one half h bar omega, it goes increases by an integer each time. So uh, let me point out the feature that I was talking about earlier. So this would be the uh, b point beyond here would be the classically forbidden region. This is how much energy h bar omega, how much total energy the particle has. So classically, it could be a particle bouncing back and forth, but it'll never go beyond here. But when you look at the wave function that represents the particle, this is what you are seeing. You have this portion of the wave that is beyond the classically forbidden region. And this actually exaggerates a little bit the likelihood of particle being found here because the probability is actually this wave thing squared. So proportionally, this ends up being smaller portion of the squared thing. But it's still significant. And the same thing holds for this higher energy. So this is the classically forbidden region. You have some wave function here. Um, and I guess. Um, we will, I think we will have time to talk about this more as we do step potential. But if you have some intuition for differential equations, this is how you can kind of think about it. Um, what do you notice? Do you notice anything about these wave, func wave function solutions by chance? What do you see in this classically allowed region as you go to higher and higher energy? There's more node. More node. You see it oscillating, right? Yeah. So in this region, where the total energy is greater than the potential energy, that is what you are seeing. You are seeing these oscillations. So when you get solution to this equation, 
there are some regions where the solution you get will tend to be an oscillatory solution. And there are regions where the solution you get will tend to be an exponential decay solution. Let me rewrite that a little bit. Uh, let me rewrite this, uh, um, let me rewrite this Schrodinger equation to give you that sense of intuition. So I'm going to rewrite it this way. I'm going to solve it for this highest order derivative. So when I do that, this is what I end up with. Highest order derivative is equal to, so I moved this over, so e minus v. So e minus v of x. And then I, um, Divide up by this, so it's my uh, it's minus two m over h bar squared, um, and then psi x. Okay. This is how you get some sense of intuition with this. So you are not trying to solve this because this is a functional position. It can get complicated. You're just trying to see intuitively how does the solution behave. And the key here is that you have the second derivative, uh, which will give you your function times some kind of a number. And this number can be divided into, well, at least two distinct categories. If E, is greater than v of x, then this number is negative. Right? And if e is smaller than v of x, then this number as a whole is positive. Okay? Imagine you have a simpler differential equation that looks like y double derivative is equal to minus ky, which would kind of correspond to this. What kind of solution do you expect for y of x here? Sines and cosines, right? Or complex exponentials, right? So that's what you get. In this case, you get an oscillatory solution. You can kind of think of it as a uh, the, the wave, it bends, always bends towards the zero. So when it's above here, it bends down towards the zero. And when it goes past the zero, it bends back up towards zero. So that kind of behavior leads to oscillation up and down. And what, if, what about if you have a positive coefficient here? What kind of solution do you expect for y? Exponential, Exponential solution, yeah. Can it be a complex exponential? I mean, it has to be real exponential, right? So that when you take double derivative, the coefficient is positive. So it's a real exponential solution. It can be exponential rise or decay. When you match boundary conditions, you essentially eliminate whatever leads to your wave function going up, you know, blowing up to infinity. So, and that's what you are seeing here. In the region uh, where the energy is smaller than potential, then you get an exponential decay. You can look at it as the curvature of, which is related to second derivative, curvature of the function curving away from the zero until it asymptotically reaches zero. So that's some intuitive sense you can develop about the uh, time-independent Schrodinger equation so that you have some sense of how the wave functions is behaving. And th this is the key point that leads to the, the there being a non-zero chance of the particle being found in classically forbidden region. Oops, um, the, the reason for this is that when, the, when this happens, when potential energy becomes greater than energy, your wave function does not suddenly drop down to zero. It, so it switches from being oscillatory function to an exponential decay. But you know, depending on the decay constant, it takes some distance to decay. And in the distance of decay is where you are having a non-zero probability of finding a particle where its a potential energy is greater than its total energy. Good, that makes sense, kind of. All right, uh, I guess that's uh, all I have time to talk about for harmonic oscillator. Um, the rest of you, I'll try to put in some homework questions where you're doing some simple calculation, but once again, to emphasize, you will never have to memorize any of this.